Home video cassette recorders became common in the late 1970s and during the 1980s. However, the VCR might have entered wide use years earlier if things had turned out differently. Prior to the more widely known Betamax and VHS formats, there was an ambitious attempt in the early 1970s to produce and market a home videotape system called Cartrivision. Cartrivision was a project of Cartrivision Television Incorporated, which was a subsidiary of defense contractor Avco. Avco introduced the system at the Consumer Electronics Show in June of 1970. Unlike the standalone VCRs that came later, Cartrivision units were built into 25 inch TV sets. Rather than being sold under the Cartrivision name, the sets were made by Avco, Admiral, Packard Bell, Emerson, Montgomery Ward, and Sears. Montgomery Ward and Sears marketed the sets under their own brand names in their stores. The system used half inch tape and square cassettes consisting of two reels stacked one atop the other. Some cassettes could record up to 114 minutes. The units had a wind down timer for scheduling recordings. It was unable to select specific times and dates like later VCRs, but it was easy to use. Foreshadowing the video rental industry of the following decade, several Hollywood movie studios made their movies available to CTI. A company called Cartridge Rental Network was established to handle the distribution of movies on Cartrivision cassettes. Rental tapes were selected from a catalog at a retailer who had the tape shipped to them and then picked up by the customer. After viewing, the tapes would be returned to the retailer who sent them back to the distributor. This predates the original iteration of Netflix by almost 30 years. To avoid profit losses from repeat viewings of rental tapes, the studios required that they couldn't be rewound on the home unit. Rather, they could only be rewound by special equipment at the retailer, and these tapes were only available through the rental system. Pre-recorded tapes were also available for sale, and these were mostly educational films, documentaries, sports, and do-it-yourself programs. These could be rewound on the home units. An optional black and white video camera was also available. The system had stereo audio output, however, stereo sound was only available on some of the pre-recorded tapes. Tapes made with the camera were in mono. A color camera was being developed, but was never produced. The company was also developing standalone recorders that could be connected to an existing TV, but these weren't produced either. Sales of the units started in June of 1972. The cost of the units was $1,600, equivalent to almost $10,000 in 2024. Despite the interest in the system from the public, slow sales resulted from the high cost of the units, lack of pre-recorded media, and salespeople not being familiar with the system. Salespeople treated the units as simply large TV sets, and the units simply didn't get the attention of customers in, in the stores. Adding to that, stores kept the tapes on a different floor, separate from the units. The tapes themselves were expensive as well. The majority of the 100 to 200 titles available for purchase ranged in price from $13 to $40, or $98 to $300 in 2024. Movie rentals cost three to six dollars per rental or twenty three dollars to forty five dollars in two thousand twenty four a second viewing required paying a fee of three to seven dollars or twenty two to fifty three dollars in two thousand twenty four dollars to rewind the tape on a technical level the units were seen as difficult to operate and the picture quality was fuzzy Later in November of 1972, during the lead-up to a sales push for the Christmas season, it was discovered that tapes stored in warehouses and in stores were discovered to be decomposing. 
most of the inventory was defective and had to be recalled, as the tapes would have damaged the machines if played on them. By early 1973, only 2,500 units had been sold. A massive promotional campaign was conducted to prove the viability of the system. The company carried out an advertising campaign to promote the system and prove that it was viable. 130 stores on the U.S. West Coast were part of the sales effort. Salespeople were trained and were knowledgeable about the units. A stock of tapes were available, and four-year credit deals were offered along with free tape rentals. Sales figures did improve, and another national sales effort was planned. However, sales weren't enough to recoup the large amount of money invested in the company. In June of 1973, the company making the units, Avco, pulled out, and CTI filed for bankruptcy. Following the end of cartridge vision in 1973, many of the TV sets equipped with the recorders, separate recording mechanisms, tapes, and other components were sold off by surplus retailers. Many electronics hobbyists purchased the systems and made their own modifications, such as building a standalone player with an RF modulator to allow it to be connected to any TV set, like later VCRs. Some hobbyists maintained their own cartridge systems into the 1980s. Cartridge was indeed very promising. It might very well have launched home video years earlier than it actually was. However, the technology of the time simply wasn't mature enough to make the system more affordable and easier to use. Along with those problems, access to available media was limited, and the rental process for movies was complicated. Perhaps if rental outlets like the video stores that became popular in the 1980s had existed at the time of Cartridge Vision reaching the market, things might have been different. Despite its short life, Cartridge Vision did give a glimpse of what was to come in the realm of home video. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And remember, when the future was cool,